محمدا رسول الله ويقيدي أدنو إليه ساجدا بجبيني اقبل صلاة Uh, time is very limited and time and the topic is very deep and profound, so I will jump in immediately. And I will firstly give a disclaimer to the elders actually. The topic is geared towards our my younger brothers and sisters. So I hope that inshallah you understand that they are the intended audience. I have a series of questions to ask and I will respond to them one by one. Firstly, why do we believe? What's the benefit of having faith? In an ever increasing faithless world, when the number one religion in many lands, even in America, the number one fastest growing religion is not Christianity or Islam or Buddhism, the fastest growing faith is a lack of faith. This is the number one on the charts for the last five years. In many Nordic countries, you have 60, 70, 80 percent who say, We don't believe in a God, we don't believe in organized religion. It is on the rise. In a land, in a society, in an era, in a world where faithlessness is becoming the norm and people of faith, whether they're Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, are becoming the minority, the question arises, why have faith? Why should I have faith in a faithless world? The response, there are many, I'll mention five. Number one, first and foremost, the most obvious is faith answers the biggest questions of life. Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Some of our thinkers of our times have given a simple example. If you've heard it, then bear with me. But it's a very profound example. Imagine if one day you woke up and you found yourself in a luxury jet, flying. And all of your needs were taken care of. The best food, the best drink. But you had no idea how you got there. You had no idea what you were doing. You had no idea what's going to happen when you land. For how long would you be able to enjoy all of the comforts of a luxury jet? Sure, it's fun for a while. But if you don't know what you're doing there, if you don't know where you're going, if you don't know who put you there, what is the purpose? The perplexion, the questions that would come, the unanswered enigma that would come, would actually gnaw inside of you, and you wouldn't enjoy anything of all the amenities. And this is the reality of our life. Faith answers the biggest questions, and that is why, whence, where, whither, what is the purpose of us coming here, who put us here, that is what faith answers. And this is why nothing substitutes faith. Faith, and that's what Allah says in the Quran, when He's addressing the Prophet Fahada. We found you, Ya Rasulullah, you were not guided, we guided you. Even the best human being did not know the answers. We know he would go to Allah of Iraq. We know he would be thinking about life and questions that he doesn't have answers for. And that is why Allah says in the Quran, We lifted the burden on you. Our scholars say, we lifted the burden you had. That burden was these unanswered questions. The questions that come to every intelligent, rational human being. Muslim, Christian, Jew, Hindu, atheist. Everybody at some point in life asks, why? Why? Why all of this? And if you don't have faith, there is no answer that is palatable. You will have to construct an answer that does not satisfy. It's an answer that doesn't really give you any, you know, as, as the Quran said, it doesn't fulfill your needs. So faith answers that big question, number one. Number two, about why we have faith. Number two, faith teaches us how to live. Or to be more precise, it teaches us morality. It teaches us right from wrong. You see, without a higher power, without belief in a higher system, left to our own devices, morality becomes ever-changing. What is right today becomes wrong tomorrow. What is wrong today becomes right tomorrow. And we see this in the history of our own land. We see this in the laws that are ever-changing, even in our own lives. We see this in morality and sexuality and gender. We see this, the things changing so rapidly that we don't even know what's going to be lived tomorrow. Who is going to decide what is right and wrong unless it is a higher power? Allah says in the Quran, If truth 
follow their desires. This is a powerful, powerful verse. If truth were subject to a democracy, if truth is subject to a majority vote, if the majority decide what is right and wrong, then Allah says, the truth would be corrupted by their desires. And all that is in the heavens and earth would suffer as a result of that destruction. Truth is not subject to a majority vote. What is wrong is wrong, what is right is right, despite what the majority says. In this land of ours, for 300 years, racism was embodied in the DNA of this land. It was institutionalized in the Constitution. The founding fathers we look up to, the founding fathers of the Romanticized, they institutionalized that a black man is equal to three-fifths of a white man. Go read the Constitution. Racism is still rampant in our societies. And this was politically correct. It was legislated. The Supreme Court considered it to be morally right. Our Prophet says some 14 centuries ago, when no philosopher, no other human being said this, he said, it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter whether you're white or black or yellow or, or whatever. All of you are equal. It was not politically correct to say that back then. But he said it because truth supersedes. Truth is transcendent over any group of people. But see, here's the point. Those smart, intelligent people that lived in this land in the 1800s and 1700s, the greatest minds of the 1900s, they were pretty much all racist. Why? Because the mind is fallible and it absorbs the culture one lives in. It's so easy for us in 2019 to look back and say, oh yes, yes, racism is wrong. But I challenge you, I ask you to think, if you lived a hundred years ago without religion, without Islam, and you happen to live in a land where racism is endemic, racism is enshrined in the system, do you really think, do you really think that you would have been able to challenge status quo? I don't think so, because that's not what people did back then. So the point being, without religion, there is no morality. Without religion, who gets to define right and wrong? And again, Allah says in the Quran, that's... Who better to tell you than the one who created you? You see, if we all get together and we see this in our politicians, how can humans rule over other humans unconditionally? We all become selfish. Politicians become corrupt. They want their own power. They want their own perks. How can humans decide what is best for other humans? They themselves, it's a selfish issue involved. And that's why Allah says, Who better to tell you morality than the one who created you? Allah mentions in the Quran, Did mankind think that he would be left without a moral reality, without being told what is right and wrong? Did mankind think that we created you without a system? No, that's not going to happen. So what faith teaches us is, it doesn't matter if all the world says alcohol is wrong. This country unanimously agreed alcohol is evil. They all came together, the politicians, and they said, my God, alcohol is destroying liver cancer, accidents, the, you know, the, the, the amount of money that is being wasted, the crime, everything. They all came together a hundred years ago and they banned it. We all know this. We said it's in middle school. They banned alcohol in this country. Before Allah told them, they didn't know Allah told them. It was from their own experience. They said alcohol is bad. But guess what? They couldn't enforce it. And so in the 21st Amendment, they repealed the 19th Amendment, as you know. And so they said, well, fuck, whatever, we can't do it. But they realized it's wrong. Once again, 14 centuries ago, our Sharia came down and said, no, Allah says in the Quran, alcohol, yeah, there's some good in it. But it's evil far outweighs the good. Who will tell us this? other than the one who created us. Again, we look at morality and sexuality, everything changing. Now it's all based on consent. Now it's all if two people want to come together, and I have to be blunt, excuse me, but consent, that's how you define what is legit and illegit, and that is why in some European lands, incest is now becoming legal. It is permitted in some European countries for siblings and for parents, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, above the age of 18, to get legally married. And you know what, based upon their parents, it is completely legit because if it is consent well then what's wrong with two 19 year olds or a 19 year old and a 42 year old if you get my drift what's wrong with that and that's why this was challenged in some European courts when two consenting adults who happened to be you know very closely biologically related were not allowed to get married they said why you allow it for everybody else we're consenting I'm above the age of 18 so who is going to decide morality? We need faith. We need a higher power. And that is my second point, why we need faith. The third point, why we need faith. Accountability. Accountability. Judgment. 
We see the world is very unfair. That's just a fact. We see that evil people get away with crimes. We see many righteous people suffering. And we really feel a sense of unfairness. It's not fair that corrupt politicians get away with stuff. It's not fair that rich, powerful, you know, dictators and military warlords happen to do things and still live luxurious lives. Whereas those whom they harm, those whom they're trampling over, those who are, you know, robbed and steal and raped and pillaged and all of this, they're just living miserable lives. Or they're killed innocently. Who is going to stand up for justice once again? Without faith, there is no justice. With faith, what happens? Maliki Yawmiddin. There is a day that everyone will get what they deserved. Allah says in the Quran, أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ اِفْتَرَحُوا السَّيِّعَاتِ أَنْ نَجْعَلَهُمْ كَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَلِحَاتِ سَوَاءً مَا حِعَمْ وَمَاتُمْ Did the people who do wrong think that they will live the same way as the people who did good, their life and their death, and that's it? أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ دَحْمُونَ Do you think that the righteous and the sinful will be the same? What is the matter with you? How can you judge? Allah is bringing in the concept of judgment day to prove His own existence, to prove there will be a judgment day. This world is unfair. That is the reality. That is why there is a next world. That is why there is an afterlife. With faith, you then have that sukoon, that sense of peace. You know what? That righteous person will be rewarded for that righteousness. And that evil person will face the judgment of what they did. That's point number three. Point number four of why we have faith. Point number four. An inner peace and contentment. A connection with our Creator. A peace that comes with knowing that all that has happened to us, it happened for a reason, it happened for a purpose. Frankly, faith, Iman, helps us remain sane in an ever crazy world. Faith anchors us. It gives us a sense of situating ourselves. You know, I mean, if you know where you are, and you know where you're heading, and you have a map, you have a sense of peace. Okay, you know what? I can see what's going on. But imagine you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're heading, you have no map. Then you really feel a sense of despair. And that is why study after study has shown, and again, I want to be very careful, don't misinterpret these words. Study after study has shown that faith, generally speaking, helps deal with issues of a, a mental or a depression or some issues. It doesn't solve everything, don't misunderstand me. It's not the end all and be all. But generally speaking, people of faith can cope with tragedies, cope with disasters, cope with calamities better. That doesn't mean if you're not able to cope, you don't have faith, don't misunderstand me. No, the general rule, faith gives you the fortitude, the inner peace, the courage that you need, the conviction to live life in a more positive manner. And that's why one of the biggest blessings of faith is that faith gives you an optimistic look even on life itself. Faith gives you a sense of courage and optimism that doesn't happen without faith. And the final point I mentioned for this question, there are other questions as well. And the reason I'm speaking so fast is because I have so little time and so much to cover. The final point I'll mention for the first question. What was the first question, guys? You can remember? Why do we, why do we, why do we, why do we have it? I'm just quizzing, make sure you're following along. The fifth point I'll mention is one of the biggest positives and perks of faith is that faith gives us a sense of shared community. Look around. Well, I look around. People of all different backgrounds, all different ethnicities, all different trades and professions, all different languages. What combines us? It combines, what combines us is faith. Now, one can say, oh, but there are other things that combine as well. Tribes combine, countries combine, nations combine, geographic origins combine. I have given a much longer lecture. It's called Ummah versus Nation State. Listen to that online. Ummah versus Nation State. It is true. There are other communities that exist. Communities based upon ethnicity. Communities based upon skin color. Communities based upon where your mothers gave birth to you. Communities based upon other factors. But the fact of the matter, no community has stronger bonds than a faith-based community. And we see this in the Ummah. We see this in the Ummah. Nothing competes with the bonds of the Ummah. So who cares if the person next to me was born in the same village that I was born? What does that mean? Does it mean I share the same, the same ethos, the same values, the same identity? Not at all. Who cares if it's the same skin color? That's racism. 
What really matters is your philosophy of living life. How do you choose to live? Who is your God? What are you doing here? What are your rituals? The common calendar, the qibla, the, 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 the salah, the whole concept of ummah, that is what brings us together. We have a shared value that comes with believing in the same Lord, having the same system of, of, of wanting to live our lives. The community that the ummah comes with is the strongest community. And this is undeniable. Nothing is stronger than the bonds of the ummah. And this comes once again, and we all need community by the way. I mean, you can't live on your own. And communities, they bring about a sense of stability, a sense of identity, a sense of structure. Your bonds, your marriages, your children, they all need these communities. And the strongest community that brings about that stability is the community of the Ummah. And this comes from faith. So these are the five things. Number one, the purpose. Number two, morality. Number three, accountability. Number four, contentment and inner stability. And number five, identity and community. Okay, second question. You guys follow it? Yes. Am I going way too fast or there's only 15 minutes left? This phone. Speed, speed good enough? Yeah. Okay, this is, enough. this is for the younger generation, so my speed is fine for them. <laughs> the, the, the second question, okay, we, we, the first question was why have faith? We answered that with five points. The second question, which faith? How do we decide based upon this whole, you know, uh, selection of faiths that we have in this world today? Which faith? How do we decide which faith is the one we want to choose? And to answer this, I'll give you three points. And again, obviously you understand each of these questions deserves many volumes, many hours. We don't have time. I was given 30 minutes to solve this massive problem. It's not going to happen. But at least we begin the discussion is the point. I have your minds, inshallah, and my minds thinking along these answers. So how do we decide the validity of a faith? We have all of these different isms out there. Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Sikhism, Confucianism. We have all of these different philosophies. How do we decide between them? I'll give you three simple you know, parameters. First and foremost, the most important question that we ask when we look at any faith is what is this idea of God? Because that is the most important question. Who is God in this faith? And what is the relationship between man and this God? And we say confidently that no other faith is as reasonable, as logical, as simple, as common sense as that of Islam. One God that is completely beyond our imagination. We don't carve Him. We don't put Him on a rock and pedestal and bow down to Him. Not a multiplicity of gods that doesn't make sense. Three gods, ten gods, a million gods. One God makes sense. One God, one structure, one order. That God is all perfect, all powerful. The purpose of life is worshipping Allah and then praising Him. These are things that we can understand rationally. And our point is, no other faith is going to be as simple and as clear as this. As well, the belief in prophets. How does this God communicate? Does he come down and walk amongst us? Or does he send people that he has chosen? Again, if you think about it, we would say the more rational is that he has chosen people, the prophets, that are sent. As we said, other major questions, morality, life in the hereafter. You look at all of the faith traditions, we would say, logically speaking, the faith that makes the most sense in answering the biggest questions. Remember, I'm saying the biggest. We're going to come to the more difficult questions in a while. The biggest questions. Who created me? Why am I here? What's going to happen after death? These questions, go look at all the other traditions. Do you really want to believe in reincarnation? That you used to be a toad in a previous life, you're going to be a frog in another life? Does that really appeal to you? Does that make sense to you? And, and, and by the way, even that, how do you understand human souls are increasing? Does it make sense reincarnation? Right? That doesn't make sense. Do you really believe 3 equals 1 equals 3? I mean, even the greatest theologian of that faith tradition cannot explain how 3 equals 1. How did he die when he was God and he was the one who created himself? It doesn't, they just lose after a while. Do you really believe that there's a multiplicity of gods? Every single neighborhood has a different god that you worship in a shrine? Doesn't make sense. Look at the simplicity of Islam. And there is no faith that competes with La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. How simple, how sweet, how pure. But that's not the only reason. There are other things as well. Of them, how do we know our faith is true? How do we know to decide between a faith? Well, Allah does mention, it is in the Quran, that believe in miracles. Okay, what miracle do we believe in? So for us as Muslims, the ultimate miracle is the Quran. And the beauty of this miracle is that the Qur'an, I just gave a the last week, it's, it's online, called the miracle of the Qur'an. It's last week's quote, but you can find it on my webpage. The miracle of the Qur'an is that you don't have to believe in somebody else who saw the miracle. It's not like Moses in the parting of the, of the Red Sea. 
It's not like Jesus and resurrecting Lazarus from the grave. It's not like a, a previous prophet doing something you have to believe. No. The Quran is something you and I can feel, can touch, can sense, can read, can hear. The Quran is there for us to all examine. So Allah is challenging us. If you really have doubt in Kuntu fi Rai, if you're in doubt, then produce a book similar to this. Bring a Quran similar to this. But you will never be able to do that. So the miracle of the Quran is also one of the main reasons why we believe in the truth and the veracity of Islam. And again, listen to the recitation of the Quran. It is something that even the Quran mentions. When you hear the Quran, you know these are ayat from Allah, miracles from Allah. These are miracles. Ayah actually means miracle. We call every verse a miracle, an ayah. That's what ayah means, it's a miracle. Every verse in the Quran is a miracle. And the irony, and I speak as somebody who is non-Arab, and I grew up not speaking Arabic, now I'm fluent in Arabic. I grew up, you know, Desi background, didn't speak any Arabic. Memorized the Quran completely without even knowing what one word means. And I remember clearly, and I know most of you, all of you in this audience know this as well, even if you don't understand the Quran, you know that it is a miracle. Without even understanding the Quran, you know that the Quran is a miracle. What a miracle is that? That without even understanding the words, you know that it is a miracle. The impact of the speech on your psyche, the way that it moves your soul, the way that you know you're uplifted, you know that this is a book, no human can compose it. That miracle is there, tangible for all of us. And that's one of the reasons why we know Islam to be true. That's point number two. The final point to this question, we have one more question, and then inshallah it's time for the prayer. The final point to this question, I said number one, Islam answers the biggest questions properly. Number two, the miracle of the Quran. Number three, it's a very deep topic I've spoken about this in other lectures as well. The fact that the, the, the religion of Islam resonates with our human psyche perfectly. It fits like a hand fits to a glove perfectly. The human psyche and Islam fit together perfectly. They're in sync, they're in harmony. And this human psyche is, has a word in the Quran. It is called the fitrah. It is called the fitrah. Allah says in the Quran, He created all of us upon a fitrah. And the fitrah is the natural disposition that we have. The natural disposition is a gift from Allah. It's a moral compass that resides in our hearts. It's something that we don't even know how to describe it, but we see the effects of the fitrah in our conscience, in knowing something to be right or wrong, right? The Marvel fans can say the spider six plus six cents here, okay? That type of sense, you know, something there. Something you know to be right or wrong. Where do you get a conscience from? How do you know something that is not something you learned or taught? It's ingrained in you. That is the fitra. We say the fitra and Islam are compatible. And this explains, by the way, another phenomenon. In the whole globe today, every faith is losing traction. The number of Christians and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists, and yes, I have to say even Muslims, it is amongst its own community. It's kind of slowly decreasing. However, in lands of Islam and in Muslim communities, the decrease is so minimal compared to other lands. Pew, Gallup, all of these national and international organizations have done surveys after surveys. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in angels? Do you believe in the afterlife? And in predominantly Christian lands, for the last 20 years, it's been going down much, much more severe. In Muslim lands, do you believe in God? 97%, 95%. Do you believe in the angels in the high 90s? Do you believe in the Akhirah? High 90s. Still, Islam thrives, even though the practice we know is not. But in the hearts of the people, by and large, Muslims deep down inside believe. Why? Why is it that across the globe, so many religions are losing adherence? And alhamdulillah, Muslims, I'm not saying that we don't have people who leave the faith. Of course we do. That's why we're having this, this conference here today. It is happening. It is a, a phenomenon we don't like. But compared to other faith traditions, Alhamdulillah, we are way better, even though we don't want to have any, we want to have zero. But compared to others, simple example, England is an Anglican country. The Christian sect of Anglican Christianity was founded in England. Seven years ago, the Guardian newspaper did a survey. The number of Muslims who pray Jumu'ah is more on Friday than the number of Christians who go to Anglican churches on Sunday. Can you imagine the small minority of Muslims Muslims are barely 5-6% of England. 
right? 6% at max in England. That 6% quantity-wise is more faithful to Islam than the 90% of Anglicans that live in England. What does that show? Look around you in any state, in any country, in any of these states we live in in this country. On Sunday, you have churches wanting people to come. I once passed by a church, I'm not inventing, I'm not making this up. It said, free cookies if you come at 9 a.m. on Sunday, right? They want you to come, free cookies, chocolate chip cookies, come. I like chocolate chip cookies, right? We, on the other hand, on our Fridays, I have heard with my own ears, Brothers, sisters, if you come after one o'clock, don't come to our ministry, you go somewhere else, parking will be full. Parking will be full. We have a parking problem on Jum'ah in every single masjid in North America, and I say to that, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we have a parking problem. You see the positive, I'm not trying to say, solve the problem. When I say Alhamdulillah, people are coming, don't misunderstand me that we don't solve the parking problem. Solve it, but I'm saying, Alhamdulillah, Islam is alive. Look around you on a Sunday afternoon. Alhamdulillah, a thousand plus people to come and attend a lecture on Islam that's just an average lecture on Islam. People want to know our faith community. Alhamdulillah, it is still alive. Why? Because of the fitrah. Because the fitrah and Islam are compatible. And deep down inside, the average Muslim, even if they don't pray and they drink and they do this and that, Allah forgive us and them, even if they're not practicing, still deep down inside they feel, you know, Islam is true. And they know that because of the fitrah. So these are the three things that we have. Number one, answering the big questions. Number two, the miracle of the Quran. And number three is harmony with the fitrah. We now move to the final point, and I have exactly six minutes to conclude this point, okay? We have a phenomenon of our, some of our young men and women leaving the faith. And because of the internet, and because of YouTube, they have a platform. They have a platform. They're a very small percentage. But their percentage is exaggerated. And you think it is more than it actually is because of the internet. The democratization of knowledge, right? I mentioned this in a previous podcast. And so, Paula, again, brothers and sisters, let me be brutally honest here. The organizations that gather these people who have left the faith, I'm not going to mention their name, their annual conventions barely get 50 to 70 people. Whereas the average Islamic convention here is 10,000, 15,000 people. I mean, please, don't, don't miss the forest for the trees. I understand we all might have heard or know of one person who left the faith, but don't exaggerate. It's not a phenomenon that's overtaking our whole ummah. Alhamdulillah, it is a very minuscule phenomenon. It does exist. We need to challenge it. We need to be frank about it. But Alhamdulillah, by and large, it's not really affecting us. And that group wants to exaggerate its own importance in order to feel better about themselves. But it's not something that is shaking our community to the core. And all you need to do is look at the statistics that have done this. And uh, the statistic they quote, by the way, is not accurate, but that's besides the point. The point being, though, if you look at their objections to Islam, if you look at their objections to Islam, I will categorize them into two broad categories. And perhaps in the Q&A, we can go into more detail about this. Two broad categories. All of their objections about Islam. The first of them, specific Islamic rulings that they say clash with human rights or democracy or morality. Specific Islamic rulings, whether it's due to gender or sexuality or morality or whatever, something in the Quran, and they say, look, this doesn't make sense because human rights, because charter of whatever, because of the world that we live in. And the response to this is, these people have absorbed the morality of their era without question. Just like a century ago, their ancestors would have absorbed other moralities of that region. A hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, just like the Quraysh, when Allah revealed the Quran, they said, we found our forefathers doing something else, why should we follow you? Our forefathers buried girls alive, why should we follow you? Our forefathers ate meat that wasn't killed properly. Our forefathers worshipped idols. Our forefathers, our culture. And Allah says, what if I bring you something that is better than what your forefathers were upon? You see, the finicky nature of our human mind, that group believes the human mind to be essentially infallible. And study after study, survey after survey, has shown the human mind is very, very, very fallible. 
The human mind absorbs its own culture and it cannot see beyond its culture. The average human mind is so influenced by its culture, it's difficult to break away. And that is why when wrong becomes rampant in society, it takes a lot to change that wrong. We see this with racism, with, 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 with the, the version of slavery that existed in this land. So many things took centuries to change. Why? Because it was accepted as fact. These people have taken the morality of 2019 as the standard. And they judge the Qur'an and the Sunnah not on the biggest questions. This goes back to my point, the biggest questions. But rather on the tertiary questions. We do not decide the validity of a faith based upon how many times we have to pray, based upon the morality law, based upon sexuality. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe certain types of sexuality are harmful, maybe they're not. How do we know that? We have to trust in a creator. That creator has told us. So, once we come to the conclusion, logically and rationally, that Islam is true, then we accept it as a package deal. We do not question the fine print. That's not how we decide that that product is for us. We decide it based upon the biggest question, not on the tertiary. So that's the answer in the first point. And that is, the tertiary points of morality, of halal and haram, of the rituals, that's something beyond our mind. We don't know for sure. We don't know whether our minds are fallible in this regard or correct. We don't know. We are products of our culture. We're products of our society. So Islam is telling us something. We might understand the wisdom, we might not understand the wisdom. Our understanding its wisdom does not change the validity of Islam. That's my point. We need to take a step back. We do not decide the validity of Islam based upon a tertiary question. The final point, inshallah, before we conclude, the other section of questions they bring is the bigger question of trying to understand why evil exists. Why did God create a world where there's hunger, where there's war, where there's this, where there's that? And this is a question that actually goes very, very deep and ancient in human history. The fancy, fancy term is theodicy, the existence of evil. Many books have been written, pre-Socratic philosophers, so Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the, the, the Jewish Christian philosophers, the medieval philosophers, Muslims, they all grappled with this question, how to come to terms with the fact that there is pain, suffering in this world. And I have given lectures, you can find multiple ones online, why is there evil, the wisdom of suffering. I have given lectures, you can go into more detail, but in a nutshell, I want to conclude my series, my point with this. Sometimes, Sometimes, we cannot understand why there's pain in suffering. I agree. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. But, to reject a God because we don't understand this one instance of suffering creates an infinitely more complex series of problems than to accept a God and say, you know what, I don't know why this happened. Allah knows best. He is the all-wise and merciful and Maybe I don't understand this. You see, this group of people, because they don't understand why was there starvation here? Why did that child die? Why is there war? How can God allow this? They end up rejecting God. And the irony is, neither have they solved the problem of why they're suffering, why is there evil, why is there... Did they solve it? Did they do anything to actually bring a tangible answer? Have they come to the all-wise answer of why a child dies of starvation? On the contrary, neither did they solve that problem and neither have they answered the bigger questions of life. Why are you here? What's the purpose? Where does morality come from? What is going to happen after death? So they end up in an even more conflicted state, not even having solved the first problem and having created an infinitely longer list of problems. Now, can you answer the question why there's evil? The response is, if you have faith, then yes, you can. And if you don't have faith, then you can. If you have faith, then you believe in an afterlife. And in the afterlife, there is ultimate justice. That child that died of starvation, that parent that this happened to, that young sister that that happened to, that boy that that happened to, there is an afterlife. And in that afterlife, all of that pain and suffering, all of the trials and tribulations, they will be rewarded back much better than in this world. But if you don't believe in an afterlife, you don't believe in a hereafter, then how can you possibly begin to understand this world? This world is not the end. It is a continuum. It is a stepping stone. When you have faith in a God, you have faith in a higher purpose, you have faith in a hereafter, then perhaps you can at least say, Allah knows best. I don't understand, but I trust Allah that everything is happening for wisdom. When you end up rejecting God, 
not only have you not solved the initial problem, you end up having no higher purpose in life. Not even knowing why you're here, what you're doing, where you're going, what's going to happen. And that creates a sense of not even identity. You don't have an identity. And that's by the way, if you look at Nietzsche and some of the great philosophers of old, that's what happened to Nietzsche. Nietzsche, the famous philosopher, they say the place, last great philosopher of the Western world, he literally said, by destroying God, you have destroyed yourself. Nietzsche predicted this. And he himself went insane towards the end of his life. By destroying God, you have nothing left to live for. He predicted this even when he was an agnostic and atheist, and he ended up in that way. To conclude, my dear brothers and sisters, the three questions I asked is, why have faith? And the answer that we have faith because of purpose, morality, accountability, contentment, and identity and community. How do we know what faith uh, is the right one? I said number one, because it answers the biggest questions in a proper manner. Number two, that the miracle of the Quran. And number three, the harmony of our faith with human psyche, with the fitrah. And the last point I said, the questions, the criticisms that come, typically there are two categories. Number one, it's they don't understand why Allah made this haram. Why would Allah forbid this? Why would Allah allow that? And the response is, faith is not decided based upon you understanding or not understanding. Perhaps there's a wisdom you don't know. Just like with alcohol. People didn't know is it good or bad. Allah says there's some good, but the harm is more than it's bad. Allah said so. There has to be an element of trust here. And then the second point, why do we not understand this version of evil? And I said, in the end of the day, perhaps you can't fully understand, but believing in God and believing in hereafter allows you to understand better than rejecting God. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the faith and make faith firm in our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always allow our iman to increase. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our children after us. And inshallah we'll continue after Salat the mother لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال